So I'm Roger Sutton, I'm the boss at CERA, and the purpose of this afternoon's session is to have a, um, a discussion around insurance issues, and I've got um, a bunch of people who are senior in the insurance industry in Canterbury who are here to um, participate in the discussion and answer your questions, so what I'll do first of all is um, introduce, all, introduce them. So first of all is John McSweeney, John's give you a wave. John is from Southern Response. So Southern Response, as you all know, has um, picked up the claims from AMI. That's right. Yes. Um, Dean McGregor is Morning. from IAG. Dean's next along. Dean's going to give us a wave. Um, John Beckett. And John is from Vero. No. Lumley. Yes. He's from Lumley. I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon, John. And then on the end, we've got uh, Philip Andrews, who's from Tower. So what I was going to do was I was going to do my, do my seven or eight questions, depending on how the mood goes, um, and then we're going to open up to the floor for your, for your questions. Does that all sound like a reasonable way of doing things? But I thought, if I start off with my questions, that kind of gets the ball rolling and you get to work out um, who's who and all that sort of stuff. So, I mean, the first one is just around the land stuff. Um, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people I've spoken here today have got land issues, and the question is who is going to fix my damaged land I've got on my property? If I've still got a big sinkhole or something like that, who's responsible for fixing that? Who wants to take that question? I'll start off with that. Um, for the land issues, EQC is responsible for land. As private insurers, we do not insure land. Uh, if the land is damaged and EQC makes a will ultimately make a payment for it, uh, then that's the responsibility of EQC and the repair is, is the owner's. What will likely happen though is that during the repair process, a lot of any reme remediation that's needed will happen as part of the uh, rebuild of a new home. Uh, for what Southern Response can do to um, progress uh, customers that have got land damage and want to progress with their build is take what's called a deed of assignment over any potential payment that EQC might make for land damage and we will use that as part of the foundation process in the new rebuild. So John, does that mean, I mean I've met one or two people today who've got some sort of unpleasant land issues right now, issues that are causing moisture and damp and those sort of things, how, how would one think about those sort of issues? So you, want it, you don't want cash for that, you want someone to fix it. How does, that, does that mean, should I be talking to EQC and saying, EQC, I've got you know, the sinkhole, it's continuing to further damage my house, it's causing dampness through my house. What advice do you have for those sort of people, John? It, it, if it's related to land, then it is the responsibility of EQC to either do some um, remediation on it or to make payment for the remediation or removal of whatever's there to be done. Okay. Yeah. But, it, but it, I want to add to that, if there's liquefaction under your property and then EQC, if, if there, it's an undercap claim, EQC will remove that liquefaction as part of any repair for the property. Can, we, can you speak into your microphone, John? They're just struggling there. If the liquefaction, for example, is under your house, then the liquefaction is removed as part of the repair of that property. So if it's over cap, your insurer would take care of that. If it was under cap, EQC would take care of so that. Right now, so right now, John, if I had a whole lot of liquefaction under my house and I was over cap and that liquefaction is causing dampness in the house and those sort of things, what should I be doing? Should I be talking to you if you're my insurer at Lumley? Uh, definitely, you should raise that with your case manager and we'll see if what we can do. I and mean, obviously, priority would be to see if you're a vulnerable customer and get you at the front of our program of work and get your house repaired as quickly as possible. Um, what, so we've, with our program of work, we've got the vulnerable customers, as most insurers do, right at the front of the queue and we want to deal with them straight away. So if there are health issues, that's something you need to let your case manager know so we can make sure you're right at the front of the program of work. Well, the next question was around um, the introduction of different technical categories. So a lot of people here are TC3. So, I mean, I think there was a lot of frustration from a lot of people that, you know, we did have these different, cat different technical categories of, you know, TC1, TC2 and TC3. I mean, do people, do you feel that having different technical categories has slowed down the rebuild? Just... So, yeah, sure, 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 here's some answers on that. 
Dean, why don't you yeah, start off, Dean? Yeah, sure, Roger, and good morning, everyone. I, look, I think it's fair to say that clearly TC3 has slowed things down overall. So just the, you know, the delay in having to wait to establish you know, what um, categories were, which categories... Um, and then, you know, the, the requirement of having special uh, building foundations, etc., to, um, you know, to build in TC3 or to repair even in TC3. So I think, you know, everyone would, would accept that it's clearly slowed things down. Um, in terms of the way forward, though, which I think is, you know, which we're, we're trying to focus on, TC3 is open, well, at least from an IAG point of view, for us to build in TC3 and to and do major repairs there. So we, we have many properties that are sort of advancing in that respect now. It, is, uh, it has been slower than other parts, so TC1 and TC2, but uh, there is no delay now other than if the uh, land is severely damaged and requires a, an EQC payout before that can happen. But similar to as John from Southern Response mentioned, if there's an opportunity for us to uh, work with you and arrange a deed of assignment um, over the land settlement, there are many situations we are able to, um, to get on and advance things. So, and that becomes a personal choice for you as to whether you want to assign the, um, the proceeds of your land settlement to your insurer or not. So um, while it's been slower, I'd say we are underway and making progress now. I mean, the other thing I'd say is that one thing that sort of initially was slowing things down about us having confidence that we're actually foundation solutions out there that we're going to work on, on different sorts of land, in particular TC3 land. So what we're now seeing is a number of sort of what I'd say is quite innovative, smart foundations solutions that are actually, you know, I think the insurers and your engineers are getting more confidence in. So one of the ones, if you wanted to go for a walk later on, is the Firth Foundation, which is out the back. Has anybody seen that? So that's that Firth Foundation, which is in two parts, as a, a base part, so to speak. <laughs> there's, a, there's, a base, there's a base, you know, bit of concrete, if you like, which is reinforced with, um, with, with steel. And there's another foundation which goes on the top. And then the two foundations are then joined by large bolts. And then if the extremely unlikely thing happened and there was another shake. <laughs> and even less unlike, even more unlikely house ends up on a lean, which a number of you have actually ended up being on leans. You can then basically just apply a very, very large spanner to wind the bolts out and re-level and re the house. So that's, so, you know, and in fact it's, it's almost as simple as pull up the carpet, go get a really big spanner, wind up the bolts and your house is re-leveled after a couple of days. So there's actually a version of that out the back of the, about, about, about the back of the, um, the convention place where you can go have a look at. So some of those sort of things I think have taken time to come along, but I think some of those foundations are much cheaper than people initially thought they were going to be, and that's going to allow you know a lot of rebuilding to happen. So I think you're all confident in those foundations. Yeah. Yeah. Be, I would just add that there's actually a, a range of options now for TC3 <laughs> property. Um, so that's the good news, and the cost is actually getting closer and closer to being cost neutral with what a 3604 would have been. So whilst yep, the delays for TC3 properties have been frustrating, the good news is that we've actually come up with viable economic solutions that will mean your house is sustainable and reinsurable long term. I, from Southern Response, agree that that's certainly um, what's happening now. On our Southern Response stand, which is just down the main corridor there, there's a model of what's called a 2B foundation, which is another new design. It's a little um, model uh, that you can have a look at and physically see what some of these new foundation designs, new to Canterbury, uh, actually look like. And it's well worthwhile just having a look at it to see what can actually be done now at a reasonable and economic price. Good. Is it possible that my TC3 land is so badly damaged that it can't, cannot be repaired and rebuilt on? So I think you know a number of people have come up to me today saying, look, Roger, I can't believe anyone's ever going to build a house on my land. It's, it's so broken. Um, are we seeing cases where, where the land is so badly damaged it can't be re rebuilt on? I think um, it's, it's very rare, um, and as insurers, we certainly don't make any of those decisions without really referring it to the, to the right experts, which in this case are the geotechnical um, engineers. So they, they really have to make the call. I have heard of um, a handful of situations where the engineers have said to us, look, um, this site is extremely badly damaged, and it would be very, very challenging and difficult to rebuild on this site. 
but it's very small in numbers. So, and I think it's a very case specific situation. So, look, I would hazard a guess that it probably wouldn't affect anyone, you know, in this room or in, you know, in the stadium. But um, my experience at IAG is that it's very, very rare. Um, but there are some of those exceptions. So, I'm not sure what the other guys. And, but are. Dean, as a policyholder, I could, I could contractually force you to rebuild, even if it was going to cost you a fortune. Uh, well, you could do if it was physically possible. So what some of the engineers are telling us is that it just wouldn't be advisable to. So It would have to be consentable, wouldn't it? It would have to be consentable, and then it's likely that we would end up having a conversation with you to say, look, you know, we could build here, but it would cost you know, an enormous amount of money, and it may still not be that advisable from an engineering point of view. Why don't we work together to try and achieve something else, which might result in either buying an alternate property, building somewhere else, building on some better ground somewhere, where there are a range of options that we would look at to, to help you. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, as Roger says, um, if, if it was uh, physically possible, then the policy could allow for that. But my, my advice would be to work with your insurer, um, because really, do you want to be on land at the end of the day that is that vulnerable that an engineer is telling you it's not advisable? Although, how, how is the land? So in that case, well, actually, we'll, we'll just, if people want to talk about that, we'll talk about that, that at the end. Should we move on to the next question, which is, um, tell us about time frames. Tell us about time frames for each, well, why don't we go down, why don't we start at your end, Philippa, this time? Sure. So tell us about time frames for repairs, and particularly people on T with, um, with TC3. Okay, so our priority... Microphone closer for me. Closer? Uh, uh, our priority is vulnerable customers, so we currently run a vulnerability register. Um, we look at a number of things, uh, under those criteria and effectively what we're saying is that we would like to prioritise those people to get them back into their homes as quickly as we possibly can. Um, we are running a end of 2015 campaign for all of our repairs, so that's our goal is to have all repairs completed and people back in their homes by the end of 2015. Um, there will be some outliers where the, the situation is quite complex and we just can't manage that, but that is our intention. Um, rebuilds are slightly less of an issue because obviously that's uh, something that can, can progress as quickly as people desire once they've, they've got their budget. Um, but certainly repairs are something that we're working hard to make sure that, that people are back in their homes as quickly as they possibly so can. So in terms of if I was a rebuild, well, how long would I expect a rebuild? Uh, to be honest, if you've, if you've got your rebuild budget, you could go out and build a house as soon as you can get consent for it. Um, so we're, we're encouraging people to go and speak with builders. We, will, we want people to go and see new home builders and building companies, um, and we want to make sure that, that they're starting to design their homes once they know what their budget is. And I would, I would imagine probably 90-odd 90, 90 percent of our customers already have that information, so they're in a position to start designing their homes. So 90% of, of your customers have got a, a budget. They've been said, look, you've had a 300 square metre house or a, and here's your $300,000 or whatever the number is. Okay. Off you go and then come and see us again when, you're week, when, you, when your next step is. That was yeah, simple. correct. So once they've chosen a builder, they'll come back to us and we'll have the discussions around how we run the contract and that sort of thing um, and making sure that they can progress from there to get building consent. John. <laughs> Yeah, we've, um, our programme of work finishes October 2015. Um, we've been doing a lot of work making sure we've got the right level of capacity and the right solutions, particularly for the TC3 and Hill properties. And we've obviously had to make sure we get all the geotech done. So all our geotech drilling will be completed by the end of this year. And that will mean that we have uh, structural engineers reports on each of those properties. And then we can go to building companies, ask for costings, and that will enable us to actually assess your property fully and finally. Our program is that we will manage the whole project for you. So we deal with the builders either for repairs or uh, rebuilds. And um, your case manager will be in touch with you shortly to arrange an appointment to actually discuss that process with you. We expect to have every customer visited by the end of June, but a phone you'll have had a phone call and an appointment made by end of April. And in most cases, each customer will know when in the program they are by end of May. So um, I think you were asking before how long does it actually take to build a house? Well, a repair can take six to nine months, the whole process, once you're actually uh, ready to go to consent through the consent process, and nine months for a rebuild. So we've got to get a lot of things lined up to make it all happen, but we're very confident that we'll have our last job finished October 2015. 
And at IAG, we are targeting the end of 2015 to complete our entire rebuild and repair program. Um, similar to other insurers, we are prioritising uh, the most vulnerable customers first. Our approach has been, and at the end of last year, we were able to give the majority of our customers uh, an indication as to which quarter between now and the end of 2015 we would expect to start that work, and that was based on the priority or the vulnerability that we understood of the customers at the time. So if that changes, or if we didn't have um, your specific details and you don't think that we've taken that into consideration, then I'd certainly encourage you to visit our stand and, and let us know about your personal circumstances, and we can make sure that that's taken into account. There is a little bit of room for us to be able to to, to juggle the program if we need to. Um, we, uh, similar in terms of the rebuild process, our estimations are based on what we've done to date, is that a major repair is about 45 weeks from the uh, design phase right through to the completion um, and code of compliance. Now that differs depending on the property, of course, that's very much an average, but that's what um, we're experiencing to date and a rebuild through the design phase right through to code of compliance and, um, and completion is coming out at about 50 to 55 weeks. So that's sort of, a, again, very much a, an indicative average. But overall, we're targeting the end of 2015 as our program completion date. We also uh, manage the process for you through our PMO partner, Hawkins. Um, so if, you're, um, if your choice is to work um, and have us to support you through the build process, then that's what we'll do. Alternatively, you can talk to us about either using your own builder, um, in which case we'll support you with one of our loss adjusters, or another option is if you wanted to, uh, to take a cash settlement, then that's available as well if you simply just wanted to manage the process yourself um, using your own builder or, or however you wanted to go about that. And with uh, Southern Response, our program at the moment is scheduled to go through into 2016 for the completion of our major repairs and builds. Um, for those that uh, are choosing to build with Southern Response, it can be, um, it will be managed through Arrow International, our project management partner. Uh, there is an option to do what we call a self-managed build, where you can take the rebuild money and find your own builder and manage it yourself. Uh, which you can do. The alternative, and approximately two and a half thousand of our customers have chosen that they will uh, have their new house built through the uh, Southern Response and Arrow International project management. Um, we're finding, um, unfortunately, the same sort of time frames for major repairs and for uh, a rebuild right from uh, approximately 12 months for a rebuild right from the day you start the first initial design right through to um, working drawings, getting the consent ready, getting uh, all the uh, processes that are needed. It does take quite a long time. Uh, we've communicated with some of our customers over the last couple of weeks as to when uh, we expect to be able to commence the design and then construction phase of their house. The balance of our customers uh, will be advised of that by the end of May, we'll be starting uh, in early May and within uh, a couple of weeks and certainly by the end of May, all the Southern Response customers that have made a decision to rebuild with us uh, will know the scheduled uh, date for the uh, design and construction to start and within that advice, uh, as with the other insurers, there is a vulnerability um, facility and we've uh, uh, made provision that you or family can advise Southern Response of any particular vulnerability issues, whether it's financial, whether it's health, whether it's children or, or any sort of other factor, and that will be considered to uh, change the scheduled uh, build for you. Um, we do have some, we've allocated some space in our build capacity for vulnerable that we don't yet know about. So I think there's also just a clear message there that if you have got significant issues around health, the very elderly, significant financial issues, I mean I know some people who have been out of their house and, have met, and it, all, everything's just backing up on them, they should be talking to you guys at your stands today about what their particular circumstances are and you are saying you are very sympathetic to change people in the build process because of that. Well, what about what about the people who aren't particular? Well, what about the people who've just got a bloody terrible leak in the roof and it's gone on for the last two years now, and you you know it's kind of about to send you mad, and you're still two years down down before you're going to get fixed. 
What happens to those leaks in the roof? Who, who's, you know, who, whose responsibility is to fix those? If the claim's over cap and you're dealing with your insurer, then I would say it's, you should be talking to your insurer. Um, the last thing we want to do is to make the damage worse, um, because ultimately then the, the claim will become worse. So um, we'd be happy at least at IAG to carry out temporary repairs and make sure that that, that leak was put to a stop so that um, it didn't continue to, to cause damage. Um, and you know, and if, um, if that didn't mean that you changed in the, the build program at all, you're still scheduled to have the, the major repairs or rebuild done at a later date. But our priority is, is to make sure that you're still comfortable in your home. You shouldn't be living with a, a leak that's causing you discomfort or causing further damage to the property. So, so Dean, it may, you know, so I've got this fancy tile roof, which I thought was this wonderful asset. It turns out to be a horrible bloody liability. Um, it's five grand to go fix this leak. Is that five grand going to come off the amount that's spent on my rebuild? Well, it depends on what the situation is for your property. If your property is repairable um, and all it is is preventing further damage occurring to your property, then no, it won't. Uh, we will do that to uh, reduce any further damage that might occur to the property. If the property was a rebuild and um, and it was designed and that temporary repair was required to enable you to continue living in the home, then it would come from your alternative accommodation portion of your policy. So what you're saying is, if I was if I was entitled to a $300,000 house and I've had $5,000 worth of fixing done to my roof, I'll still get a $300,000 house, but I'm going to get less temporary accommodation assistance when I need it. If but it's a rebuild. That's if it was a rebuild. Yeah. And therefore you'd be relying on the government have got, have got the temporary accommodation assistance, which tends not to be as generous as your temporary accommodation assistance. So it will just depend on how that, how that plays out. Does that, does that, make, that answer make sense to people? I mean, I think, I think, I think the, the government's temporary accommodation assistance, is someone here, can do that? we've said that's carrying on until 2015, haven't we? It's going to be a nod or a wave, one of my staff there. Mike, it's 2015, isn't it? March 2015. Correct, OK. I think, too, Roger, the other thing, exact, Southern Response will do exactly the same as what Dean has indicated through IAG, and we were talking about how it's 12 months to get a new house built from start to finish, but the construction phase, so you'd still be able to live in your house while the working drawings are being prepared, while the design's being prepared, while the consent's being prepared, so uh, it wouldn't be that you've got to be away from your property for that whole 12 months. It would just be the construction period, which is sort of typically 16 to 20, maybe 26 weeks, something like that, depending on the complexity of the house. And normally it would be the, um, if you're living in your house currently, when everything's set to go, uh, demolition would be undertaken, that would be scheduled to start, so immediately after that, the foundation work can commence. So, I mean, I guess my, my strong advice is if you've got one of those situations going on, um, Talk to your insurer, and you know, I think this is also something that the residential advisory service, we've got a little standout here, the insurance sort of support service we're setting up. That's the sort of thing we see helping people with those sort of issues as well, making sure they can actually have those sort of conversations with their insurer in a way they feel they get, they get some, some resolution. Because I think it's very stressful for a lot of people in those sort of situations. Um, new policies on TC3 land. What, what, what's happening with new policies on TC3 land? John, it doesn't really affect you because you're not an insurer, you're just a fixer? Uh, that, that's, that's correct. Southern Response will not be insuring properties going forward. Our responsibility is only to um, repair or rebuild the houses. Uh, however, uh, if you had an AMI policy and Southern Response is building, repairing or building your new house, at the end of that process, AMI will continue under the IAG umbrella, will continue to offer insurance to you. Yeah. Dean? So IAG is uh, writing business in TC3, so we are offering new insurance in TC3. It does uh, usually require us, and it's site specific, but you will usually require us to have um, damage reports, so we need to understand you know, what stage is your property at, has it been, if it's, a, um, if it's they had an EQC claim or a claim with another insurer, then what's the, what's the state of, of that claim, what level of damage has been done. If it's a new build, it's relatively easy because it's being built to the the, the new standards that's required to, to achieve a consent. Um, otherwise, there'll be sort of some requirements around probably providing us with some reports so that we can ascertain exactly you know what the property is. But uh, the, the short answer is yes, we will consider new insurance in TC3. 
And I think, I think you'll also consider doing contract works insurance people on TC3 land too, won't you? Yeah, uh, similar assessment circumstances. We'd need to know exactly what it was that you were building, um, but on the basis that new, all new properties are going to have to comply with the new foundation requirements in TC3, it's more than likely than not that we would insure it. John or Pip, do you want to add anything there? You're both insuring TC3? No, Lumley at this stage is not writing new business in TC3, but that's under review. Um, and it will be very similar to what IAG around what we would write in the future will be very dependent on what it is. If it's new, it's a brand new property with uh, new foundations, it's very likely it would be accepted. Um, and if it's existing property, it would be very dependent on what level of damage it's suffered and what the repairs have been. But at this stage, we're not writing new business in TC3. Pip? So Tower are writing new business for new builds. Uh, we will consider new business for existing homes built post-1950, providing obviously they meet certain criteria around damage, etc. Um, so it's worthwhile coming to speak to us if, if you do have properties that fall into those categories. Um, we may look at whether you have existing business with us already for your, your contents and your vehicles, um, but certainly we will consider business in the TC3 areas. So in some ways, I think what Pip's saying, it's really code for, bring us all your business, because we make reasonable margins out of all that other stuff, the contents and the cars, I'm just being, you know, let's cut to the chase here, bring us all your business and then we'll insure your house as well. Sorry, let's just, you know, let's sure. not. Well, you know, that's the honest thing, you know, the more business you bring them, the more that actually we're willing to do, do all that other stuff as well. Am I okay, Philippa? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, one question I got asked just out before was a, a woman who was um, living in a, a big house, um, which was a repair, and she wasn't sure it was a repair, she thought maybe it was a rebuild. But anyway, she was interested whether she could maybe build a smaller house, a new house, and pull her old big house that was really falling down um, as an alternative. So, you know, she's got a 200 square metre house at the moment, and she actually only wants a 150 square metre house going forward, but she'd much prefer a new house, which is double glazed and insulated properly, compared to getting her old house rebuilt. How, how are you guys feeling about that? From a southern response point of view, if uh, a property is a repair, uh, in discussion with us, that repair cost could be cashed out, particularly if somebody wanted to uh, take that money and put it in towards a new house. Uh, you'd have to look at the finances for the economics of that. You'd also need to be aware that the property owner would be responsible for demolishing the old house. Um, the insurer would only pay the cost that it would have cost them to undertake that repair. But it, that sort of option could be um, available for some people, particularly for major cost repairs, yes. And, and just on the point of, you know, if the customer or you as a customer is doubtful as to whether the assessment is correct that the property is repairable, then I'd certainly encourage that you ask to sit down with an assessor or somebody from the PMO or, or what have you to understand exactly why the assessment has um, you know, been done the way that it has, because I think the, the first point is, is you, know, you are entitled to maximise the amount under your insurance policy that um, you've paid for, and so you should be, uh, should be comfortable that it's been assessed in the correct way. At IAG, if you wanted to cash out or if you wanted to take that repair cost and build something that was um, of smaller, uh, more, a smaller size and at a lower cost, then we would be happy to work with you to achieve an outcome like that. So it would be very dependent on the circumstances, but um, you know, sort of the, the principle is that yes, we would work with you uh, and we would uh, find a way, hopefully, to be able to help you achieve that. John. Yeah, definitely. You should discuss it. If that's an option you want to explore, discuss that with your case manager. We're more than happy to convert repairs into rebuilds, but its overall cost is set by the cost of that repair. Um, if the cost of the rebuild, including, including the demolition of your existing property, can be attained within that um, scope for the repair, then we're more than happy to put you in our program of work. We just have to work out where you would fit and whether that changes the date that we can do it on. Um, but that's definitely an option you can discuss with your case manager. Uh, so the same for Tower, what we would consider doing if you wanted to use the repair money is, is giving you the cash. Um, we would then put you in touch with a, a panel of builders that we use uh, for the rebuilds to allow you to discuss what you could build for that money um, and we would certainly be willing to reinsure afterwards. So, but a couple of concepts if you were going to go down that road. 
is to make sure that if you are going to take the cash, is it, you know, you're going to get, make up a number, you know, 250000 for your repair. You want to make sure you've got a really, a proper contract from a builder that he's going to build you your new house and demolish your old one for 250000 You don't want to have a conversation with the builder down at the pub and write something down on the back of, you know, the fish and chips that he's just eaten. You actually want a sort of a really proper contract. So when you do take the money from the insurer and you turn up to the builder the next week, he doesn't say, oh, hell, I'm actually really busy now and the prices have gone up. You want to have everything, everything absolutely locked down um, to the great extent you can. And you want to work with someone who knows how to make that sort of thing work before you did it. Because, you know, there is some risk in doing that, especially if you take the cash and then build the house yourself. If the insurer is agreeing to build you that smaller house, you're in a, it's, it's a much better position to be in because they take any sort of cost escalation risks on themselves rather than you doing it. But you also need to make sure they'll ensure you're going forward as well. You want that whole package. So you really want to work with someone who's kind of been there before who can hold your hand through that sort of process. So well, that completes my seven questions. So I thought we'd now throw the floor open to any questions people have got. Have we got microphones as well? We've got microphones and we've... The microphone is just to make sure that everybody else can hear your question. They're not for any other reason. At the back, we've got a question at the back already from S S Sandy. Hi. I'm just wondering what all of your um, policies are around homeowners insulating during the repair process. Not obviously the rebuild, because that's covered by the standards, but during the repair process. So, that, so that's the case where you're rebuilding a room or something. The room has fallen off the house and there was no insulation in the wall before it, beforehand I guess, is that what you're saying? Are you going to put insulation in the wall and the ceiling and all that sort of stuff? That's right. Or even if you choose... I can start Sorry. with that question. If you, but also if you as a homeowner wanted to do more than was possible in the repairs. Okay, so, so what you're saying is you're willing, to put, you're willing to put some of your own money in as well, possibly, okay? Yep. Yep. So if I start with that, that question, if... Um, at any time, if you're doing something with your property as a part of the insurance claim, that it needs something to meet um, the current um, building code or consenting practices, then that's generally a cost that your insurer will bear. So um, in some cases it might be, and somebody else might be able to correct me on this, but insulation, my understanding, in an external wall um, might be a part of the consent requirements if you're doing extensive um, renovations or you're opening up the, um, you know, the, the walls, etc. But the, the test is, if it's required under the consent, then it's a compliance cost covered under your insurance policy, at least with, with IAG. So that's really the test to any situation that you might have like that. Um, if you're wanting to do some what we call sort of owner variations um, during the process, then that's a case-by-case -case sort of situation. We'll work with you to understand what the extent of those variations are. If they're relatively minor, generally they can be accommodated. If they were really significant, if you were sort of doubling the size of your house, we'd probably work with you to say, look, why don't we cash settle your claim um, and to enable you to get on and, and manage that process. Um, so that would be the situation at IAG. Southern response would be very similar to that. If it's a, a minor variation that you want to do, then uh, we could work with you because uh, there would be issues around the extra time that that process would take and when we've got our work scheduled or programmed with other customers as well, to suddenly um, double the amount of time on one house uh, would interrupt that program. So that's part of the consideration. Uh, exactly as Dean mentioned, if uh, insulation, as an example, is a requirement for the building consent, then yes, it's covered under your insurance policy for the cost of that. Um, and uh, it, if it was major that what you were wanting to do, it could be again a case of where you talk with your insurer and uh, maybe uh, get the cash settlement and then you can uh, make your own arrangements for that um, more extensive work or renovation that you want to have done at the same time. Anything to add? John or Philippa? No, we're, we're lovely, exactly the same, although we've got, had had many examples where the customers have wanted to put insulation through the other rooms, so when the insulation people are in doing the repair, um, we just step back and allow them to finish the whole house and then go back and finish the repair off, so we've worked that into a number of repair jobs already. Go. That would be the same for Tower. Um, so we have certain criteria around what 
we will allow people to extend their repairs to. Um, so it, what we recommend is that you come and speak to your, your claims handler when, when you know what work you would like to do, and then we can work out whether you fit into those criteria. Next question. Where is it? should take over here. Which was that? What, sorry, was that? I beg your pardon. So, another, sorry, the question which I should have raised was um, there are a number of people here in um, uh, properties where they're cross leased or there's a body corporate and they have different insurers. Some may be over cap, some of them are under cap. Um, tell, us how, tell us how the insurance industry is going to manage that because for a lot of those people that's gone on, you know, it's a very, very frustrating area. I'll start with that one again because I've been in the thick of um, trying to work across the insurance industry to uh, find a resolution to help um, get through this and so having really got into understanding the details I really understand the challenges that um, you know shared property whether it's cross lease um, whether it's multi units that are uh, say a block of um, you know six units stuck together present real challenges because um, all insurers and EQC have independently assessed them to date and we need to find out what we'll figure out the way to manage those collectively going forward. So the positive news is that the insurance industry and EQC are working collectively together. We're about to start a pilot, which, which we've already started the pilot, of looking at a number of properties um, where, where how do we work in a way that's coordinated so that at least one party takes responsibility for fixing all of the properties. So this is a pilot that we, as I say, we have underway at the moment. We would expect that over the next two to three months we'll get the learnings out of that to see if there is a viable way for the insurance industry and EQC to work together to manage the, the overall repair of these properties in a coordinated fashion, which, in, you know, at least in my opinion, um, it makes real sense to do so. It's very, very difficult if you have to have, as individual property owners, um, you know, you're left to the devices of having to manage that. There are lots of legal issues uh, managing the property so that it must go back on the existing footprint. Uh, you have to reinstate in many cases under your cross-lease um, you know, um, legal requirements. There's, there's lots of issues that need to be worked through. So we're trying to put together a, a solution that will deal with many of those issues and work with all of the parties so that um, you end up dealing with one, one party essentially to help you through that process. So, so as to say, it's in a pilot phase at the moment. So the idea would be, if I just if we imagine that you four all live on, you know, you're in four elderly people's houses all joined together with a firewall between each one of your properties. Um, John down the end has got almost no damage at his house, you know, for some reason, but Philippa down the end, it's pretty much a write-off. Um, as I understand this trial is that Philippa's insurer, because she's got the most damage, will be the lead on it, and will basically then work with all the other parties to get all four properties fixed, and there, and you've all got different insurers, so in fact, John's actually only got EQC because he's just under the cap. Your, your insurer, Philippa, will lead the whole process and then basically bill all the other insurers for getting the work done. Is that how I understand it? So that's, that, that's what this trial is about, to see if that can be made to work. And we're going to be very, very keen to see that can work because for a lot of people, the, the elderly, the most vulnerable, that's been a real area of, um, of frustration. So that's, that's a trial which is getting underway with... A, a 10 properties in the next few weeks? Yeah, it's underway now, so we've uh, collected all of the assessments around all of those properties. Um, we've engaged with a, an independent loss adjusting firm that will work across all of those properties and they will be the central point for coordinating it. So what we'll do after that is we'll look to see how well it's worked, what we can improve on and whether that can be rolled out to the extent of the other properties. So we're working as hard and fast as possible to, um, to get the findings out of, that, um, out of that trial so we can get cracking with them. Is there any more? Is there any more questions around the, the multi? Should we just take any more questions around the multi-unit thing? While we, is that on the multi-unit? Is that ha everyone happy on the multi-unit thing? Do you want to, is that? Should you just wait for the microphone? It's being run to you at the moment. So, are you saying if there's two units joined together and one is declared a full rebuild and one is declared a repair? that an independent loss adjuster will come 
and decide once and for all which. Yeah, and that, that you're entirely right, because that's the issue in some cases. Because they've been assessed by maybe EQC or by Southern Response or IAG or different parties, sometimes we've come up with uh, you know different um, outcomes. And it might well be that one unit as it stands alone could be repairable, but if it shares a common foundation or a common roof, then it may physically be impossible to repair one and demolish the other. So we have to come up with what is a common solution for the entire property. And that will be the role of sort of the independent party to help us get to that stage. And they may have to engage some engineers or um, some other specialists along the way, but we have to get to a position where you can actually carry out the repair. You can't have a, a notional, um, I can fix this half, but not that half. We actually have to get a, a common so, solution. So what you're trying to do is trying to have, if you like, the scrapping and the fighting, you want to have it between the insurers rather than, rather than hoping mum and dad have those fights between themselves. You, you guys want to try and take responsibility and try and get it sorted out? Is that what you're going to say, Dean? Well, we, we take responsibility for making sure that we come up with a common response under the policies. Unfortunately, we can't tell um, the individual owners what they must do or not do. So if you were in a block of three flats and one person was saying, look, I just want to take my money and do something different, we, we can't control necessarily what somebody might do in that circumstance, but we will be encouraging all the participants to work together. So that's as much as we can do. We have to come up with a common method for the insurers or EQC to respond with. If we can achieve that, then we're 90% there. The other part is getting all of the occupants to agree as to what the outcome is as well. So that brings me to another question I had, because if one of the owners wants to, is really desperately wants to move on, because they've already waited two years and their situation has changed and they don't want to wait any longer, and the other party is prepared to wait, and they want to buy the other unit, as they consider this a solution, in that they are going to be dealing with it anyway, and they're going to be making a bulk of the decisions relating to the rebuild. They might as well make them for both units and eliminate the other party. How come IAG won't allow the rebuild to be transferred to the new owner? If it's going to help a customer of IAGs move on as they wish to, and the other party help them resolve the issue of sharing a unit that needs rebuilding, okay, yet there's two the years. Dean. Yeah, so it's a, uh, I understand the situation. So uh, typically if you're selling a property um, with a, an IAG policy, the way that our policy contracts are worded is that you can, you can uh, sell the property but the insurance policy transfers to the new owner and only the proceeds of the claim. So if the, if the property was repairable, then the proceeds of the repair would transfer to the new person, but the option to be able to rebuild doesn't. Look, what I would say... Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. So what we'd need, yeah, so what we need to do is look at the circumstances and if the outcome was that it had to be rebuilt, I think we would probably have a conversation with you and say, look, the only way of achieving this is to rebuild both. It may well trigger that your policy does respond in that way. So I think it's a specific circumstance we'd need to look at. I think you should, uh, once we're at that stage, we should have that conversation. And if, if that's preventing you from moving forward, come and have that conversation with me afterwards and we'll see if we can do something to get through okay. that. Okay. Should we move on, should we move on to the, the next, next, any further, next question? Should we, over, the woman first and then this gentleman over here. Woman in the red. Um, mine's the question on the fence lines. Does that, will the insurance companies be working together like that along fence lines? So that's a, that's a, that's a common fence you're saying that, need, that needs fixing? Yeah. In fact, we're already doing that. It was one of the early, most of the insurers in New Zealand belong to the Insurance Council of New Zealand or are members of the Insurance Council. Um, so we coordinate a lot of our t activities through the Insurance Council and one of the early on agreements that we did agree across the insurance industry was um, on shared property like driveways and boundary fences is to work together because often if you take a driveway for example and you've got three or four properties coming off a common driveway generally you own a strip right out to the road so it doesn't make any sense for us to do sort of you know one quarter of the strip at once um, so one party the first part essentially the first insurer that's ready to do that job would take charge of that um, and then all the other insurers have agreed to share the cost following. The gentlemen, only, oh. 
Sorry, the only thing I'd just add to that is that um, exactly as Dean has explained, but in some cases there's some pretty major repairs that might need to be done in some of the houses at the end of that driveway or uh, a rebuild and the might, it might be uh, best that that driveway repair be held off until all the trucks and contracting equipment has gone through and, and the work has been done before your nice brand new driveway gets put in. Gentleman here. Yes, Roger. Um, we're, we're in TC3 designated land, which there's been a time uh, settlement on repairs for to 2015. Now, this was in regards to the foundations on property, and they said that there was three alternatives to different types of uh, foundations that were going to be available to these properties. Now, we've had an engineer out to our place within the last couple of months and had a check on our property, and he went under the floorboards and had a look, and he stated that the foundations that he had were the best that he had ever seen. There was absolutely nothing wrong with them at all. Now, the house needs to be reclad. The section's pretty badly damaged, but the house needs to be reclad only. The internal damage is nothing at all. Now, what I'm saying is that um, with regards to the foundations, if they're saying they're OK and the house doesn't need to be lifted or whatever, would this reduce the time frame on repairs from 2015 to within about three or four weeks? So, so what you're saying you is your, your repair is a, a pretty straightforward repair, sir. So you, what you're you saying your repair is a pretty straightforward one. It's replacing the cladding. There's not much more than that. Why can't you get on with it pretty quickly? Exactly. Right. Uh, with with regards to the foundations, at this particular yeah. stage, we would be hopeful that the foundations would be OK. Yeah, if, if your foundations are OK. Yeah. If the foundations are OK, is, is your particular claim over cap with private yeah. insurance? Yeah, it is. Right. It, just to me, um, it sounds like that the uh, initial assessment required foundation work, mm -hmm. so it was uh, identified as quite an extensive repair and it would have been slotted, in, slotted into the uh, work program. Uh, with that new information that you've now got, right. it does certainly sound like that could be revisited, um, and I would certainly suggest that you discuss that new information with your insurer, because it does certainly sound like it's a much less extensive repair now than was originally envisaged. Right, well, that's and what we're sort of aware of, because initially, back when they first started doing checks on properties, they didn't actually look at the foundation, but they just assumed that it was going, that it was to, going be, to be dangerous yes. and it would need to be done. And then would they it? gave us a time frame of 2015, which was then three years away, to, to repair it. And I said, that's bloody ridiculous. Well, that certainly would be worthwhile looking at because yep. uh, the, the, the type of um, contractors that would be involved in foundation repairs quite different from those just involved in cladding, right. and so that whole process could be cut out. Certainly okay. talk to you and sure about that. Okay, now with, with regarding the repairs to the cladding, the initial cladding on the property was uh, concrete summer hall stone, so it's a fairly heavy block. Now uh, they're saying that uh, putting a wall board up, that's fine, but it's more expensive. But I'm saying that it would take half as long to put linear wall board up as it would to reclad with a concrete block. So the, so the value or the, or the money difference would be the same. Yeah, certainly, again, that's worthwhile talking to your insurer about, and uh, the, the cost differences are, are, in fact, in those sort of areas are reducing, uh, so the difference isn't that great, so certainly, again, well worthwhile talking to your insurer, and uh, you've, you if you did go to Linear Board, you would know that you've got a, uh, a more, slightly more flexible house and a sort of more future-proof than Summerhill Stone that it had before. Thank you. I think we've got time for one last question. If there was one last question, gentlemen at the front here, and then we will wrap things up because there's another session starting at two o'clock. Can you hear me? I've got a problem with the UQC as well as insurance. UQC first uh, told me that look, uh, we can repair it. Uh, in 80,000, something like that. That was one year ago. Then they realized that uh, they didn't work it out the foundation. Then after when I told with this uh, geo reports, then they said, oh, look, uh, it's beyond us. It will be over the cap. And uh, now you have to go to insurance. So fair enough. I went to the insurance. They said, all right. Then after a couple of months later, they realized now there is a discrepancy in the UQC again. 
Now, I'm at the limbo, you know, who is going to do, you know, either insurance or the UQC. And they are telling me, you know, I don't know when they will meet or what. I mean, it's uh, lingering, you know. Since the UQC has granted me one year ago, okay, you so, can repeat so, so the question is, in terms of when you're, when are people going to get out of limbo? For people who are stuck between the two, really, that's the question. Some time frames, guys. This is, uh, this is part of the joint review process. What happens then when your claim comes to private insurer because EQC have paid a cap, then it's over cap, then it's with the insurer, uh, and an assessment will be done, and uh, the cost of the repair uh, would then be assessed. In some cases, there have been differences between an EQC assessment and a insurer assessment, but if EQC have paid you a cap, then it's clearly uh, with your insurer. But unfortunately, it's not that case. Uh, EQC has paid me, but uh, now insurance is saying no, it will be with the EQC. Uh, uh, yeah, no. I think it sounds like you're one of those difficult. Who's your insurer, sir? Uh, SIS. So SIS are not one of your brands, are they? Yeah, no. Vero. So uh, Vero. Vero are actually Vero. here. Vero got a stand. Vero are actually here. Why don't we make sure you get to talk to the Vero people after this, sir? We do that. <laughs> 